I've been in a lot of different church settings over the years of my life. I can tell you exactly how many that was, but enough. And um, there's, a, there's a verse in the, in the scriptures that says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Amen. And you know what? You guys get it. You guys get it. The, the freedom of the Spirit is here. But I'm going to go back a few years to uh, a story that when I was uh, around 13, and uh, I was raised in the city of Chicago, and uh, back then the dinosaurs roamed the, the landscape. And <laughs> some of you know, Gary, you were there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I was about 13, and we had church twice on Sunday back then. You had it Sunday morning, then you had Sunday night church. So we would go to Sunday night church, and as you know, a 13-year-old kid, you got other things on your mind than sitting there listening to a sermon. And uh, yeah, football game or whatever. Sunday night, well, that's before that was on TV. So, But anyway, um, I couldn't wait till church was over. So I could rush out there get in my parents' car, turn on the radio, and listen to what? Well, it's going to shock you, but what I turned on was a good old African-American church service on the south side of Chicago. Okay? And I loved it because those people got it. My, my brothers and sisters, I could hear on the radio, you know, and when they worshiped, they worshiped, you know? Those old gospel songs just flowed and, and God was lifted up, it was a beautiful thing. And then the, the pastor would get up there and he'd start fairly calm and slow and easy, you know? And then as the sermon went on, after the first two hours, you know, <laughs> then he would, he would get a little more excited about what he was saying, and that's a good thing too. And then you'd hear something like, preach, coming from the audience, you know. And, and then a little old sister would say, well, you know. And then, and then you'd, then once in a while, when things really got hopping, you would hear, glory, you know. And um, I always wondered, what do they mean, glory? What, what's that about, you know? And a few weeks back, Gary was, he brought up the idea of glory in one of his messages, and he gave these five terms as definitions, or what glory, God's glory involves his magnificence, his excellence, his dignity, his grace, his majesty. Well, there's five sermons right there, isn't there? But that's the way God is. He is a magnificent God. He's an excellent God. He has the most dignity in the universe. He's a gracious, humble, serving, loving, kind God. How do you think these words apply to you and me? Uh, God's glory matters. Because God's glory is what happens when he shows up on planet Earth. When you see the glory of God, you, you don't forget that. Moses saw the glory of God, and God had already forewarned him. He said, now, when, when I come out to, to meet with you, you better find a place to hide, because it's going to be hard on your eyes, you know? And so Moses hid, and it says, in the cleft of the rock, in other words, a big seam in one of the rocks, he hid and he covered his face when God appeared because of the brightness of God's glory. And then prophets, um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, a couple of prophets who saw the Lord. And there was a common thread. When Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord, he said, Woe is me. Translated to our modern jargon, it might be, I'm toast, you know. 
this is more than I can comprehend. This is more than I can stand before. And he said, I'm a sinful man. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Because the glory of God is so pure and so glorious and bright that he couldn't stand before it. Now, Ezekiel was blessed to see the glory of God a number of times. Uh, and each time, it's, it's really neat. Not once, not twice, but at least three times, Ezekiel saw the glory of God and he did a face plant. Okay? He went flat on his face before God in humility. Not because, you know, God knocked him down, but because it was so awesome that he fell flat on his face and, and worshipped God. Then there was the time when there were some shepherds out on the field tending their flocks by night. And it says, The glory of the Lord appeared unto them, and the angelic hosts were saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. The shepherds says they were sore afraid in the King James Version. That means they were scared. They just had to be told, Fear not. Don't be afraid, you guys, because this is, good, this is good news. There was a time when Jesus took his disciples, Peter and James and John, and he said, come on, let's go up on this mountain, because I, I want to show you something. And they went up on this mountain, and it said Jesus began to glow like the sun. In his garments, his, his robe became a brilliant white. And uh, Peter, James, and John... Face plant before the glory of God. So we could go on and on. The resurrection of Jesus, Saul on the road to uh, Damascus, experiences of the glory of God. And then in Revelation, right at the very end of Revelation, it says that when the glory of the Lord appeared before the throne, There was peace, there was beauty, there was brilliance, there was tears being wiped away, no more sickness. And right in the middle of the whole thing was a lamb. A lamb as he had been slain for you and me. And you know what? Because that lamb is in that position, The glory of God is not scary anymore. The glory of God is here this morning. And we've experienced it as we've worshipped the Lord. God doesn't keep his glory strictly for himself. It does say in the scripture he will not share his glory with any other gods. Because there ain't no other gods. But he is so kind and gracious that he'll share his glory with us. That is an awesome thing. So let's take a look at some scriptures and how this plays out in the Bible, and more importantly, how you and I can get in on the action of of God's glory in Davenport, Iowa. Think about it like this. You know what a tapestry looks like? What's a tapestry? If you look at the mosaic or the, uh, you know, the tapestry and each individual stitch in that tapestry represents you and me. So you're a stitch, you're a stitch, you're a stitch. We're all in stitches, I guess. And when one thread is missing, the, it loses some of its beauty. It uses some, loses some of its glory. And so God had this idea, the big picture, that he was going to do a tapestry over the ages, from day one until the last day. And he was going to take people and he was going to stitch them into that tapestry. In the center of that is Jesus Christ. But you know what? Without one of those stitches, it's not complete. And so you and I have the, have the, uh, just the high privilege of being a part of the glory that God is putting together in this big picture that he's painting. And all through the Bible, God promises us things about his glory that directly affect you and me today. Not just some theory about theology 
but an actual experiential part of God that he wants us to know. God has made some promises, and during the worship this morning, I was just thinking of um, how we were singing, Yes, Lord, Yes, Lord, Yes, Lord. Lord." And it reminded me of something Paul wrote in in his letter to the Corinthians, and he said that in Jesus Christ, all of the promises of God are yes. There's no no's with Jesus. All of the promises of God are yes. And so if you want to see God's promises fulfilled in your and my life, go to Jesus and find out about it. Go to Jesus and invite him to respond based on what God has said. When it comes to God's glory, what, what did he say he would do? And then uh, this is something you can you know, take to the bank. God said it, count on it, count on it. The second thing is the plan, how, how God makes, how he maps it out. In other words, he's got this big picture in mind, but it has to have a sequential carrying out throughout time and eternity. So even though God may not be bound by time, he knows that we are. And so he threw that in as a plan. Here's how you guys can expect to see it come out about his glory. And the third thing is the problem, why humans fall short. So God has this big, awesome plan for each one of us. And then we're going to see why, why we miss out. And then the last thing is the process, because God does get his way. Even when we screw up, he still gets his way. Let's look at, first of all, the prophecy. What does God say that he's going to do? So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. But as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And amen? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. So there's four scriptures here through from the early times until the, a time that's still future. And what is the common theme in all four of these verses? Did you catch it as you went through? Glory, glory yeah. Something about the glory of the Lord, though. It's going to fill the earth. But you know what? He's already showing us a lot of his glory. And you just got to look for it. You just got to have eyes for it. You know, there's an old saying that says, uh, seeing is believing. Well, let's try this. Believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. And when we really know that God is there, and when we really know that God's going to move, and that God is going to reveal himself, you know what? He does. Not always in the way that we're hoping for or that we're thinking that he should, but he will reveal himself. And so he's got this awesome prophecy that everything is laid out. So you can you can take that to the bank and count on that. His glory will one day fill the earth. All right. Then there's the plan. How's God going to get this done? If he's he's told us what he's going to do and now he's going to tell us, all right. Here's how I'm going to do this. And so let's go to uh, another scripture. And it, it goes all the way back to day one or before. In the beginning, read, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so here we see that back in the beginning, there was a person who was known as the Word of God, not just a spoken word. This, this is a person who was, says was with God and was God. Who is that person? Just like in Sunday school, that's always a great answer, you know. Jesus is the Word. And what does it say that the Word did? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That some, some translations say he camped out among us. And you know what? He, he didn't decide that he was going to come and have a uh, $3 million mansion. He decided he was going to come and, and be born in a barn and grew up without even a place to lay his head. You know why? Because he wanted to identify with the least of us. He still does. So he became flesh. He became one of us. And then it says that we saw his glory and he was the only begotten from the Father and he was full of grace and truth. Now, in the Old Testament times, they had a pretty good handle on truth because it was like, uh, you know, well, we got the Ten Commandments, we got the Law of Moses, we got Leviticus, and we fall asleep when we read it. But when Jesus came, he brought both truth and grace. He added a whole bunch of grace to the mix. And what that means is now God's taking a new tack. He's taking a new direction. He's coming to us with a new covenant, a new promise. And here's what it's going to be. But first of all, let's just take this one, the last phrase, full of grace and truth. We saw his glory. If you, know, if you want to know what God's glory looks like, it looks like Jesus. So look at the way he lived his life. Look at the way he interacted with people. Look at the way he laid down his life. You know, it's a strange thing, but he was talking to his disciples just before his death, and he said, it's almost time for me to go to Jerusalem, and my glory will be manifested on a cross. On a cross. He's so good. He's the glory of God. All right, the next verse is from John's Gospel, and let's read together. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you have loved me. So what did God do with his glory when the word became flesh and lived, camped out with us? Did he keep it for himself? What does it say? He gave it to us. He gave it to us. Now, we really deserve that, don't we? I mean, you know, how awesome we are. and We've never done anything wrong, never stepped on anybody's toes. So, yeah, we ought to have a piece of the action, right? Hmm. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, the next verse is um, from 1 Corinthians, where Paul's writing to the church there. And let's read together. When... Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So how are we going to do that? Why, why is this hard? Why is it hard to do everything you do to the glory of God? You can either redefine glory and make it mean something worthless, or you can say, you know, I, I, I can't do that. So how are we going to do that? Let's look at the next verse because this gives us a clue why we have such a hard time doing it. The problem. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now there's two quick things. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? We don't need to spend a lot of time on that. All of us have sinned. All of us fall short. Just uh, one thing is that it 
puts us all on the same playing field. There isn't a one of us that has a better, you know, recommendation for God's glory than the next guy. But the second thing about it is that the word falls short. You don't really get as much in the English, but in the, in the original text, it meant continually fall short. Not just once, not just twice, but all the time. We fall short of the glory of God. So, we've got a problem because he wants to do this thing and here we are messing up all the time. So, if we constantly fall short of the glory of God and God has said through Jesus, I've given them your glory, then what's the rub there? How, how is that going to happen? How is that going to work out? God says, uh, let me handle this. Let me handle this. You've tried long enough, and you've messed up long enough. I'll take care of it. And here's how I'm going to do that, the process. When God gets his way, let's read this verse. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord, as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Okay, there's a lot there, and we're not going to take a whole lot of time to unpack that, but just to know this, that this is an amazing process in which God is making known His glory in the world today. It, it's, not, it's not very often anymore that, that somebody is walking out at night and all of a sudden angels burst out and bright lights and all that stuff. Because God has a, a plan, a process that he's working in you and in me to show that glory in a new and an exciting way that he can take broken, lost people and he can show what he's like. And so what we have to ask ourselves, I think, is wh where am I in this process? Where am I in this process? How much glory is rubbing off on me? Have you ever seen a uh, little caterpillar and watched it go through its process of what they call metamorphosis? It starts off as an ugly, green, slimy thing. And when it's all done, it's a butterfly. And it's kind of a, a really good analogy of what God can do in us. Because we're born as caterpillars, and then God begins to, to throw Jesus into our lives and he begins to manifest his glory through the way we live because we're, we start becoming like Jesus. God wants to put his glory on display right now and he wants to do it in the world. He wants to do it in the Quad Cities. He wants to do it in the city of Davenport. He wants to do it downtown Davenport. He wants to do it in your personal life. What we need to do is understand that it's not about our ability, it's about God's ability. Yes. He's the one that's going to do it. Paul said, you know, I'm not confident in myself. You know, I got all these credentials, but those things are garbage. He even used a word that meant kind of like crap. Yes. And he said, what counts for me is to know Jesus Christ. And that makes all the difference in the world. So it's not about me. And my confidence is because of him, not because of me. 
So we need to understand that. It's not about you. It's about him. Amen. Secondly, is it's about God's spirit, not our performance. It's not that Paul said that the, that the letter kills. If you're going to go around trying to lead, lead a life where you never make a mistake, you never do anything wrong, you, you know, you just got to watch every minute of every day that you don't trip up, you're wasting your time. But he says it's by his spirit that he's going to do that. And so how do we get connected to the spirit? Well, we have to remember that it's about him setting us free, not putting us under rules. You know, he doesn't say, well, if you do these 10 things, then you'll be filled with the spirit. But if you don't, well, you're just out of luck. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. If you do that, and if you stay there, I'll do it. God never forces us to change against our will. And, you know, we need to want it. And if you want it, when's the last time you told him? Lord, I want to do whatever you want. Come, fill me with your spirit. Let me be your servant. Let me show your glory to people. Not for my glory, but for yours, Lord. Do that. And, and you start thinking more in terms of, well, we're Christians now, so we got to do this, and we got to do that, we got to go to church, we got to read our Bibles, we got to go out and witness, and, you know, no. What we have to do is hang out with Jesus. Yes. Reading the Bible is a great thing. Praying is an awesome thing. Witnessing. But nowhere does Jesus tell us that we have to go out and witness. He says, you get to go out and be my witnesses. So let's learn to hang out with Jesus. It takes some discipline. Amen. You've got to slow down long enough to realize that he's there. The cool thing about this whole ministry of the Spirit of God in our lives is that it sends us back out there on a mission to reflect God's glory in the world. Our, the only thing we have to do is maintain that relationship and stay close and uh, that means when you walk out the door tomorrow morning you get up out of bed maybe the wrong side of bed you know what's Jesus doing today and how is he going to use me to show his glory in the world do we say yes Lord yes Lord yes yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord yes yes Lord